Hi, how you doing? Mark Watson here from CarWow. Now cars, they're changing. In fact, it feels like every new day, there's a brand new electric car being revealed that we've just never seen before. The flip side is that there are some types of cars that are disappearing forever. They're going extinct. But these cars, they don't deserve to be forgotten about. Oh no. So here's my list of the most interesting and exciting cars that sadly will never be made again. They are the very last of their kind. Buying a new car? Then head to CarWow and my team will help you find your next car at a fair price. CarWow, your one-stop car buying comparison site. Audi loves a little bit of racing, but not just R8 supercars. It's also raced prototype racing cars at Le Mans. All through the late 90s and into the 2010s, whatever that is, what's that decade? Anyway, one of its most successful cars was called the R10 TDI. Yeah, TDI, as in turbo diesel injection. At least I think that's what it means. Now don't go thinking this meant that this car was slow. <laughs> it actually won loads and loads of races. So Audi decided some of its road cars should also have a big 12 diesel engine. You know, just to cash in on that racing car success. Race on Sunday, drive on Monday. The classic trope that engineers spout to the accountants in order to get them to sign silly projects off. Now Audi's engineers tried shoehorning this big old engine into an R8, but it didn't work very well. And in the end, they settled on cramming it into a Q7 SUV. Now, yeah, that's about as far from racing as a car can get pretty much, isn't it? They probably chose it though, because it was the only car big enough to take that huge V12 diesel. Anyway, this Q7 V12 diesel churned out 500 horsepower and 1,000 Newton meters of torque, and it'll do 0 to 60 in about five seconds. It's insane. It was the only mass-produced car to ever come with a V12 diesel. Problem is, not many people actually bought one and it went off sale in 2012. And now people are even less keen on diesel engines, so we'll never ever see another V12 diesel SUV again. Bit of a shame, I remember the launch of that car. Blew my mind just how quick it was, and yet it was a diesel. Oh well. Back in day, supercars used to cut with manual gearbox. Hey, we had to shift those ratios ourselves. But these days, cars need really, really heavy clutches that could withstand all the power from their massive, high-performance engines. This meant driving them to the shops feel like leg day at the gym. Though, of course, you'd only ever be working out your left leg, which meant that you'd look a bit imbalanced. So nowadays, every supercar comes with an automatic gearbox instead. Also, it means that you can always extract the maximum performance out of the car. Anyway, these gearboxes can be twin clutches like in an Audi R8, or a robotized manual like in the Lamborghini Aventador, which has a load of hydraulics to do all the work for your leg and and yeah, it's quite brutal anyway, when those things launch. Now, some of the last supercars to have a proper manual gearbox that you operated yourself were the Ferrari 599, Lamborghini Murcielago, and the Pagani Zonda. The Murcielago went off sale in 2010 though, and the 599 disappeared in 2012. But Pagani soldiered on, it did. It was still making special edition Zondas with manual gearboxes until 2018, which is just a little bit mad. Although you did have to be seriously rich to be able to afford one because these manuals were all one-off cars that you actually had to commission specifically from Pagani. Now the Zonda was eventually replaced by the Wyra and it had a robotized manual gearbox, which actually means automatic gearbox. So. That was the end of that, wasn't it? And now everyone's shooting for faster 0 to 60 times, so old fashioned manual is never gonna make a comeback. Not in supercars anyway. Mazda is famous for two things, the brilliant MX-5 and rotary engines. Everyone knows what an MX-5 is. Look, here's one. That's actually my MX-5. However, the rotor engine is a bit more of an oddball. It doesn't have pistons that go up and down. Instead, it uses spinning triangular rotors to turn burning fuel into horsepower. The engines are actually really, really small and compact, but they spin very quickly. So even though they don't make a lot of torque, because they have such high RPM, they can produce quite a lot of power. Now Mazda has put a few of these rotor engines in a few cars over the years, and it started with the Cosmo. Yeah, remember that? Ignore me. The Cosmo, anyway, was back in 1967. And then they used it in all various different versions of the RX-7 in the 80s and the 90s. Now, those are the ones I remember. In fact, Mazda actually put the engine in the RX-8 as well, all the way up to 2012. The RX-8 was actually a pretty good little car, so it looked nice, it was fun to drive. It also had these really cool little rear opening doors, so you could get into the very back seats much easier than if you had to just fold forward the front seat. However, 
Rotor engines aren't perfect. They have a bit of a drinking problem. They use loads of fuel and they drink quite a lot of oil, which is a little bit worrying. And they aren't very reliable either. You see the metal seals on the rotors, they actually wear out as they're whizzing round and they fail. And then you're looking at some serious repair bills for a car that actually isn't worth that much. Now all of this is the reason why the RX-8 was the last car to come with a rotor engine. And it disappeared forever in 2012. But, Mazda is actually thinking about bringing back this kind of engine for an all new sports car. Mm. Only thing is the car will probably be electric and it will use the rotary engine as a generator to charge the battery rather than to drive the wheels, which isn't exactly the same, is it? If you buy a new Porsche 911, it comes with a water-cooled engine, just like every other car with a piston engine on the road today. But the 993 version from the 90s had a classic air-cooled engine. Oh yeah. So there was no radiator and no coolant. The only thing that stopped the engine from cooking itself was the air rushing past it as you drove, and a fan on top which kind of blew all the air over it. Trouble is, if you're not moving, then there's less air cooling the engine, so these 911s used to get a little bit hot in traffic, and they're also a bit noisy, and also they're not very efficient, spewing out loads of emissions. Effectively, they're just not as efficient at producing the same amount of power as the same size liquid cooled engine. And that's why most car makers gave up on air cooled engines years ago, way before Porsche did. In fact, it took Porsche until 1997 to catch up when it launched the 911 996. Look, I've got one of those, look, there it is. Now this was the first water cooled 911 and all the purists hated it, oh my God, no. Yeah, it was lighter and produced more power, which when you're doing a new car, you kind of want, right? Admittedly, the 996 isn't as valuable now as the 993 and I'd gladly swap my 996 for 993, but that's another matter altogether. Anyway, there is no chance of Porsche building another air called 911. No way at all. And you shouldn't really miss it. Well, if you're buying new cars, not when you can get a new water cooled 911 Turbo S. I'll do 0 to 60 in 2.7 seconds. In fact, I've timed one over a standing quarter mile in 10.1 seconds. 10.1 seconds. Nuts. In fact, click on the pop-out banner up there to go watch that drag race. The Mitsubishi Evo was based on the boring Lancer Saloon, but it soon became one of the most famous rally cars of all time. It's actually right up there with the Subaru Impreza, the Lancia Stratos and the Audi Quattro. And it's famous for good reason as well. It was one of the fastest and most powerful saloons you could buy. By the time Mitsubishi got round to making the Evo 8 in 2008, there was a version that pumped out 405 horsepower from a two litre turbocharged engine. That's impressive even today. Now that car was called the FQ400. What could FQ stand for? F in quick or just FU Subaru? Anyway, <laughs> it would do not 60 in 3.5 seconds, which is insanely fast even by today's standards. This was pretty much Mitsubishi's peak though, because the Evo 9 and Evo 10, which came afterwards, only made around 300 horsepower. Don't know why. And now the Lancer has completely disappeared altogether, so there's little to no chance that we'll be getting another rally bred Evo anytime soon. Though maybe one day they'll do an electric version because Mitsubishi is focusing a bit more on electric cars, aren't they? Hot hatches are normally small, cheap cars with five doors, and they have a powerful engine up front driving the front wheels. Simple formula, don't mess with it. Okay, so some hot hatches that have so much power, they need four wheel drive. You know, like the Audi RS3 with its 400 horsepower and the Mercedes MG A45S, which has 421 horsepower. But you don't get any rear drive hot hatches anymore, like just pure bred rear drive hot hatch. Not since the old BMW M140i. <gasps> what a great car. Now this was based on the regular one series, which as you know, rear wheel drive. Only it had a three litre straight six turbocharged engine with 340 horsepower. Oh yes, this meant it could do proper slides without needing a special drift mode like the A45S, which is a sort of fudge. Unfortunately, the M140i bit the dust when BMW replaced its rear drive one series with a new front wheel drive version in 2019. Yeah, man, there's no way BMW was gonna re-engineer the whole car just for one version to make that rear wheel drive. So that is the end of that. Now, if you click on the pop-out banner up there, you can actually watch me compare the old M140i against the new 
M135i. See which is actually better. See if it is sad that BMW has taken this approach with that car. Fast Hondas used to be all about high revving, naturally aspirated engines. Simple, just the way it was. You know, this is what made the original NSX such a good driver's car. There were no laggy turbos, so you've got instant throttle response. It was the same in the S2000 and the Integra Type R and all the original Civic Type Rs. And let's not forget VTEC. When that kicked in, yo, you knew about it. As the cam profile changed and just gave you a step up in power, I love Honda's VTEC. There, I've said it, even though I've got a Mazda. Thing is, modern turbos are so much better than they used to be, so you barely get any lag with a modern turbo these days. And if you're a car manufacturer that wants to make decent power and still want to pass strict emission tests, you're gonna to have to go turbo. So even Honda and all their VTEC fanboys had to give in eventually. The last naturally aspirated hot hatch that Honda made was the Civic Type R FN2. Now this is the one that looks a bit like a spaceship and it's 201 horsepower two litre engine was the last non-turbocharged engine fitted to a sporty Honda. The turbocharged Civic Type R that replaced it in 2015 was really good. Loads of power, great to drive. It even had VTEC, but it sort of worked in reverse and didn't feel the same. And really, there's just something about a Revy non-turbo engine that I really, really miss. In fact, my favourite iteration of Honda's 2-litre VTEC was in the Mugen tuned FN2. I mean, that was properly special. I've actually driven one against a bunch of other Civics in a Honda Civic Type R Generations Drag Race. And if you want to see that, you can just click on the pop-out banner up there. Really is good. The sound of that Mugen Honda is amazing. It's worth a watch. Let me tell you a story, children. You see, back in the noughties, there was some serious competition to see which manufacturer could put the biggest engine in a family hatchback. Renault got mad and put a three litre V6 in the back of a Clio to make the 230 horsepower rear wheel drive Clio V6 one of the most bonkers cars I can remember. Then Alpha thought, hey, we need to do some of this. And it managed to squeeze a massive 3.2 litre V6 into the 147 to make the 250 horsepower 147 GTA, which just sounded epic. And when you open that bonnet and looked at that engine with those chrome downpipes, oh, it was a thing of beauty. Now you could argue that Volkswagen was already playing this game in the 90s with the VR6 Golf and its 2.9 litre V6, but they obviously knew they needed to up their game for the Mark V Golf. So they took a 3.2 litre V6 with 241 horsepower and then rammed it into that car. And of course, up the ante by giving it all wheel drive. So it could make the most out of all that performance. Volkswagen also renamed the car, they called it the R32 instead of the VR6. Now Alfa and Renault actually gave up on their V6 powered hot hatches back in 2005. And the R32 vanished in 2008, mainly because Volkswagen realized it could make a two liter four cylinder engine just as powerful as a V6 by bolting on a nice big turbocharger. And that was the end of the V6 hot hatch. Still, the R32 did give way to the Golf R, and that's one of the best hot hatches you can actually buy. Now, if you click on the pop-out banner up there, you can watch me drag race a Golf R against the BMW M135i, Audi S3, and a Mercedes MG A35. Go check it out. Hey, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a like. Also, let me know if any other videos you'd like me to do in the comments below. If you click there, you can watch some more videos. And if you click on that box there, you can actually sign up to the Car Wow newsletter, where we'll keep you up to date of all the latest news and reviews from the car world in between these video uploads. So just click on that, sign up, it's completely free. And of course, you can cancel anytime you want to. Thanks for watching. See you next time.